Welcome to the Feast of Yahuwah series. In this lesson, we are going to look at Rashid Katsir, that is the first of the harvest, which you have probably heard called Habikurim, which is the first fruits, because this is the day when the first fruits of Hasora, which is the barley, is offered up by the Kohen Haggadah. It is offered up in the tender green head as it is usually translated in Wayikra, Leviticus chapter 2. But when we look at that word as we already have, we see that Yahuwah names this Abib, which he has also named the very first month of Hashanah, the year. So Abib is a very specific moment in time because we know that it, the word literally means the tender green head. But Yahuwah's word says that the tender green heads must be parched with fire. And then they are to be weighed out as an omer by the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest. And then he is to lift up the offering, the Bikor offering, the first fruits offering before Yahuwah Elohim. And it is to be done each and every year forever as the word of Yahuwah prescribes. And this is a very special prophetic feast day, though many consider it a minor festival because Yahuwah's word does not say that it is a Shabbat or a day in which no work should be done or anything like that, but rather the entirety of the festivities hinge upon the revelation of the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest, and his offering before Yahuwah Elohim. So Rashid Katsir is the first harvest that takes place each and every year, and it happens in Chodesh Ha'abib. Yahuwah's word in Deborim 16 says that we are to shamar at Chodesh Ha'abib. Shamar literally means to look for and observe and narrowly search for. Et is usually untranslated. However, it has a very deep meaning, as we already know, because Yahuwah Elohim has given us His Word. And the Word, the Debar, is also the Aleph and the Ta, the first and the last. The very first Hebrew letter is Aleph, and the very last Hebrew letter is Ta, and that represents the idea of Debar, of Word, because the Aleph and Ta are the possibilities for all words. And the actual word for letter in the Hebrew or the Abrit, the Ivrit, as some say, is et or ot. Ot is also spelled aleph and ta. So therefore, you have the concept, again, of word, but also the word ot and et and oth can all mean a sign and a signal. So we are to look for the sign. Remember in the book of Genesis, Bereshith, chapter 1, Yahuwah Elohim says that he made the lights to be for the otot, for the signs. And they are to be for the appointed times and for days and for years. So Yahuwah Elohim marks time and begins time with signs, and those signs are lights. So when he says Shamar et, we know that we're looking for light. And then it says Shamar et Hodesh, and we know that word Hodesh literally means renewal. It is interchangeable and is often interchangeable through the Torah and the prophets with the word Yerak. And Yerak is the literal word, which means moon. However, there are applications in which it has been translated also month just as the word Hodesh is often translated new moon and sometimes month. 
They are interchangeable concepts together. So we know that we're looking for the light of the moon and that word chodesh means the renewing and the rebuilding. So we know we're looking for the very first piece of light that can be seen when the moon begins to rebuild. And that moment happens when we can see the faint sliver, the faint first point of the light of the Yerak, of the moon, in the western sky when the sun sets. Because we know that a day begins in the evening and it ends in the evening. Because there was evening and then there was morning the first day. And evening and morning the second day. And on and on and on. And Yahuwah Elohim put this into motion. So therefore, it is fitting that the sign appears in the western sky when the sun sets and the evening has come to be. So that we know that this is the new moon day. It has begun. There's the sign. But we also learn that that word Hodesh is also very, very interesting because the word literally describes polishing a sickle used for harvesting grain. And when we look for the sign, when we shamar, observe, and look for diligently that sign in the shamayim, and we see, we see the picture of the first point of light in the moon phase, when the moon begins to rebuild itself, that it looks to be a sickle in the shamayim, in the heavens. We see Yahuwah Elohim has put this in the shamayim for us to see. But the actual uh, revelation is we are to shamar at Hodesh, look for the sign of the Hodesh that takes place in Ha'abib. Shamar et Hodesh Ha'abib. Ha'abib means the Abib. When the barley is in a stage of development that Yahuwah Elohim names Abib, which means tender green heads. So when we see the sickle ready for the harvest, and we can look and we see that there are tender green heads that are appropriately sized and solidified inwardly, and they can be parched with fire. Then we know that the time has come, the beginning of the year is upon us, and we've already discovered all this information already in the study on the Rosh Hashanah, the head or the beginning point of the year, and also in the section on Rosh Hodesh, which is the renewal of the moon or the new moon or month. So all this information has been covered very thoroughly. But it is important to understand the agricultural aspect of Yahuwah's living calendar. Yahuwah has given us the opportunity to observe and look for and see the signs and know the times. And he, he's placed all this right before us. So there's the sign in the Shomayim, there's the sign on the earth, because Yahuwah Elohim wants the first fruits. He wants the Bikurim. So the very first harvest of the year, of the Shana, is Rashid Katsir. It is the offering of barley the parched abib barley that is weighed out again by an omer and lifted up as an ascending offering, a raising offering, what has been called a wave sheath. Ha omer, he lifts it up in the measurement of an omer before Yahuwah Elohim and nobody can eat of the harvest of their barley until Yahuwah Elohim gets his first fruits. No sickle can touch the grain until Yahuwah Elohim receives of his first fruits. That's how important the idea and concept of the Bikurim, of the first fruits, literally is. And remember, Yahuwah does not just ask of the first fruits of the harvest, but he asks for the Bikurim. Remember that word. Bikurim can also mean the firstborn. So he also asked for the firstborn, Habikur, the firstborn of man and beast. And we see that Yahuwah Elohim is very enthusiastic about this concept, saying that it is a sign upon our right hand and in our forehead even. The idea of giving him 
the first and the best, trusting him with what comes first so that he knows he can trust us with what comes latter. And all this is very prophetic. All this is very important. And we need to understand Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest. Because the first of the harvest is considered a minor festival. And that is because the Torah does not say that it is a Shabbat, that no work should be done on Rashid Katsir. But all of the responsibility hinges on the Kohen, on the high priest. It is his responsibility to appear before Yehulahim. It is his responsibility to parch the abib barley with the fire. It is his responsibility to lift up the offering. And again, it is so prophetic. It echoes through time and space the amazing revelation of the first harvest. And there are three harvests that take place each and every year. Again, the barley harvest, the Rashid Katsir, that is the first harvest. But there is another harvest, the second harvest, which is directly related to the first harvest because it is connected by a chain of seven completed Shabbatot, seven completed Sabbaths. Yahuwah has told us that from this moment that the offering is given, that we are to number for ourselves seven completed Shabbatot, and the morrow after must give us 50. That is the pattern. We're going to read about it in just a moment. And this time is called Shavuot because it literally means weeks, pointing to the fact that these seven completed Sabbaths are seven completed weeks, and we're counting the weeks, and that the morrow after again is that time period, and that time period is the day when the offering of the wheat is given in the form of two leavened loaves that are lifted up again just as the parched barley heads are lifted up 50 days prior. And the, again, they are connected together with the seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving us the 50th day, a picture of the fact that every seven years there would be a Sabbath year. And when you had seven completed Sabbath years, seven times seven, 49 years, the morrow after, the year after literally, would be the Yobel, would be what is called the Jubilee, when the debts are released. And so it was a time of great rejoicing. So Shavuot is also a time of great rejoicing because it is a bikur offering. But this time it is not the bikur offering, the first fruits offering of barley. It is the first fruits offering of wheat. And then in the seventh Hodesh, the seventh moon cycle, Yahuwah has told us to observe a feast that is called Sukkot. And Sukkot literally means booths or tabernacles. So many have heard of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it is also a bikur offering that is associated with this. It is a first fruits festival. It is also, all of these are directly tied to the three pilgrimage feasts as well. But Sukkot, during the time of the tabernacles, the people are to, to bring of the first fruits of those things which ripen during that time of the year, such as the figs and the pomegranates and the olives and the grapes and the dates and all these various things that produce, again, during this particular time in the land of Yashorel, in Eretz Yashorel. And the reason that this is important is because Yehu Elohim has said during this time that the Bikurim, the firstborn of Yasharel, are to bring, those firstborn males are to, to bring of the first fruits. And they're there to offer up offerings to Yehu Elohim and enjoy the Hagim, the festivals, and the Moedim, the feast days. So again, it is important to understand that Rashid Katsir, the first offering of the barley, though it is seen as a minor festival, it is huge 
in the fact that the entire idea of the beginning of the year is named Abib, Chodesh Ha'abib, the moon cycle of Abib, because of this offering, because of the offering of the Abib barley. All right, now let's go to Waikra, Leviticus chapter 23, which is the base text for this entire series. We have already read through verses 1 through 8 in great detail. But now we will pick up in verse 9. It says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yashorel. And you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and you shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. You will bring an omer, literally is that word sheaf, it is literally a measurement of the barley, an omer measurement. You shall bring an omer of the first fruits of your harvest, of Rashid Katsir, to the Kohen, to the priest. And he shall lift up the omer, or literally it is translated wave the sheaf. But again, it is lifted up in a specific fashion before Yehu Elohim as an ascending offering, a lifting up offering. And he shall lift up the Omer before Yahuwah for your acceptance on the morrow after the Shabbat, the Kohen waves it. Now in the context, we know we were just reading about Passover and unleavened bread, which happened to transpire in this same Hodesh in the same moon cycle. So we know when it says the morrow after the Sabbath, clearly we are talking about the fact that you will have a weekly Sabbath somewhere in the count of the 14th of Abib, which is when the lambs are sacrificed, and all the way through to the 21st of Abib, which is the last day of unleavened bread, which is an eight-day time frame. So at some point during this time frame, which is marked out by the Chodesh, because Yehu Elohim has said the 14th of the Chodesh is when the lambs are to be slain. So we know it is Mechodesh from the renewal. But the Shabbat is not regulated by the Chodesh. So therefore, during this eight-day time frame, on one of those days, you are going to have a Sabbath, a Shabbat. It is guaranteed. So therefore, the following day, which will be the first day of the week and the first day of the counting of the seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving you Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, a count of 50 from the Greek. If you, if you know all these things and you see this, you understand how important Rashid Katsir is because it basically gives you the entire count for Shavuot. It gives you the entire count for what has been called Pentecost. So, this is all relative. During the time, again, from the 14th, when the lambs are sacrificed, all the way through to the 21st day of unleavened bread, which is the very last day, a, a complete count of eight days total. During this time period, you are going to have a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, a one of the days. The next day, the following day, the first day of the week, during this time period, is going to be Rashid Katsir. It is going to be the time when the Kohen Haggadah lifts up the wave sheaf, when he lifts up that Omer offering of the first of the harvest, the first of the harvest of the Abib barley, that tender green head of the barley. So this is very imperative so that we understand when this observance took place because of the prophetic implications and because of the fact that Yahuwah Elohim has said that this is a moed, this is an appointed time. This was a time where all the people would gather and observe what was transpiring in the Beit HaMikdash, in the house of Yahuwah, where these things took place. 
where they were there anticipating the offerings that would transpire during that time period. So it happens on the morrow after the Sabbath, after the weekly Sabbath, because the word there is Shabbat, the morrow after the Shabbat, HaShabbat. The Kohen lifts it up, and on that day, when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb a year old, a perfect one, as a burnt offering to Yahuwah. So not only is there going to be a representation of an ascension of the first fruits or a picture of the firstborn of the barley, but there is going to be a sacrifice of blood that will be done for this offering as well. But not only will this take place, not only will there be a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one as a burnt offering to Yahuwah. But then there is also, it says, and it's a, and it's grain offering two-tenths of an ifah, of fine flour mixed with oil and offering made by fire to Yahuwah, a sweet fragrance, and it's drink offering. So there's a drink offering, one-fourth of a hen of wine, and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain. So you cannot eat of the grain of that harvest for that year until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim. So you can't have of it until Yahuwah gets his first fruits. A law forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings. So, what is very important to understand here, just to recap, is the fact that this, what is seen as a minor festival, not only is it the first day of the harvest, so it actually represents the idea of the entire agriculture for the entire land of Yashara, for every single citizen within the borders of Yahuwah Elohim's promised land. But also, this gives us the code and the idea behind the appointed times. Because the appointed times must be seasonal. Because Yahuwah Elohim has put great emphasis on these offerings. So Rashid Katsir, it is the first offering of the year. But we know it is directly connected by a chain of seven completed Sabbaths and that the morrow after would be the 50th day that's going to be Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, when the wheat offering would be lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim. So again, these two are connected. So we see not only is, not only do we see an individual uh, importance on Rashid Katsir, but we see that upon it hinges another festival and that they are truly not uh, one uh, on its own. They are connected. They're not just, you know, it's not just this offering and this offering. They are connected by a chain of sevens. And then the third offering happens in the seventh month. So then we see again the number seven. So it all comes back. So if we go on to verse 15, and read a little bit more about Shavuot, we get the criteria for the observance of Shavuot in its proper time. It says in verse 15, And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf or the Omer, again, talking about Rashid Katsir, remember? The morrow after the Sabbath. It says, with the, after the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering or the ascension offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Shabbathot, which are Sabbaths. It does not say seven completed Shabuot, which means weeks, but rather seven completed Sabbaths. That is so important to understand the exact moment of not only Shabuot, which is the Feast of Weeks called Pentecost in the Greek, but, and that means a count of 50, but 
Also, we see here that this gives us a formula to not only know when this offering would be, but also to know for certainty with a second and third witness for when Rashid Katsir, the first of the offering, the first fruits of the Abi Barley is as well. Because listen, it says, And the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf, or the Omer of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths, seven completed Shabbatot, until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. You count 50 days. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. So according to the criteria laid out, For not only Shavuot, which is the feast called Pentecost by the Greeks again, but it also tells us exactly when Rashid Katsir is because it tells us that on this day, at this day, when you offer up Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, you number for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. And it says after the next day, After the seventh completed Sabbath, it has to give you 50. So literally, there is a mathematical formula here, and it is very simple. Seven times seven. Seven times seven is 49. The morrow after gives you 50. The only way that you can make this work is that you have to begin the count on the first day of the week. If you start the count at any other point in the week, you will not be able to make this mathematical equation work because the Torah says the seven completed Sabbaths must give you the morrow after being 50. So seven times seven, 49 plus one is 50. So both Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, lands on the first day of the week, but also you see that the offering of the wheat, which happens on Shavuot, the 50th day, the day that, again, they call Pentecost, the count of 50, here it, again, happens on the first day of the week. So, again, both are tied together. There's no other way to interpret this scripture. However, if you look at the modern Jewish calendar, the modern Hillel calendar, you will see that there is influence by the Pharisees to have changed the idea of the count to 50. And I must first point out some very important truths about the history of the Yehudim and of the history of the Pharisees and what have been called the Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees are not just a sect or a denomination of Judaism, as people try to call it. Of course, we know that these were people of the house of Yahudah, which has been called Judah, but Yahudah means those who praise Yahuwah. And the Zadokim, which have been called Sadducees, were literally a lineage of people from the sons of Zadok. Yahuwah Elohim made a covenant and a promise to Zadok that his sons would serve before him. And the Sadducees, the Zadokim, did exactly what the Torah says in the Beit HaMikdash, in the house of Yahuwah, because they were in control of these offerings. And they did the first fruits of the harvest of the barley on the first day of the week that took place during the time period of Passover and unleavened bread. That's how they did it. And they numbered for themselves seven completed Sabbaths. And then the morrow after gave them 50. And on the first day of the week, they offered up the two loaves for Shavuot, for the Feast of Weeks. So the Zadokim were Kohanim, they were priests, and they were in charge of these offerings. But the Pharisees, however, 
were more of a sect. The word Pharisee actually is proshim in Hebrew, and it means the interpreters, and they came up with their own uh, ideas about the Torah and how to interpret the Torah. And years after the time period of Mashiach, when Yahushua walked the earth, it came to be that the Pharisees began to disagree with the Sadducees about this particular time, the time of Rashid Katsir and of Shavuot. But never did they disagree. Notice, if you read and research throughout the history of the Yahudim, even if you go into the oral traditions of the Pharisees, which is called the Talmud and the Mishnah, you will see clearly that the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees did not disagree on which day the Sabbath was, nor did they disagree that the Shabbat began in the evening, nor did they disagree about the sighting of the new moon or of the spotting of the barley and the, taking that into consideration with the calendar of Yahuwah. You see that both groups did these things. They agreed about nearly every single point of Yahuwah Elohim's calendar. But there came to be a disagreement. And so now you find yourself in a time after this disagreement came to be and that this position has been pushed. And the interpretation of the Pharisees is this, that Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, has to take place on the 16th of Abib every single year because they note the wording of the morrow after HaShabbat. And they say that this is referring to the first day of unleavened bread, which is on the 15th. So naturally the next day is the 16th, the morrow after the Shabbat. Well, that is an interesting idea, but the problem with this is, there are several problems actually, Within the Torah, it is not called a Shabbat. So if you're going by a literal interpretation of the Torah and the prophets, never is the 15th of unleavened bread called a Shabbat. Because in certain circumstances, of course, there is food preparation that must be prepared because of the fact that you are eating Passover beginning the first day of unleavened bread, which begins in the evening. Again, the lambs are slain on the 14th. They are eaten in the evening, going into the 15th with bitter herbs and matzah because it is the first day of matzah or unleavened bread. So anyway, they say that this is because this word is, uh, that this day rather, the 15th of Abib, should be considered a Sabbath because it says that no work should be done. And it is true that later, it began to be called in the lingo a Shabbat Haggadah, a special Sabbath, because obviously it is a special, it's a high Sabbath. Gadah literally means great or large, a large Sabbath. So it was considered that in first century time period. We see that actually in the Brit Hadashah, in the Renewed Covenant. In the book of Yahukanan or John chapter 19, we see that. We see the fact that they said that Yahushua had to come off of the stake they had to take him down because of the chief day of the Sabbath, which was approaching, which they were considering to be the 15th of Abib. So you do see that idea there. But the fact is that during that time period, the Zadokim were in charge. And the actual first fruits offering happened the morrow after the weekly Sabbath, not the 16th of Abib. But how can we further prove that that is incorrect? Well, here you have to understand the fact that the 16th can actually land on any one day of the seven-day week. Again, remember, Sheba is seven, and that gives us the word Shabua, which is week. Okay, so we know that a seven-day pattern is a week. And it has nothing to do with the Chodesh. Never do we see that Yahuwah Elohim says that the Shabua has anything to do with the Chodesh, nor does he say to count the Sabbath, Mechodesh, from the Chodesh, from the renewal of the moon. So we know that it is not related. So therefore, 
you could literally have the 16th falling on any day of the week. And so you have a very tough time fulfilling what the Torah says because the Torah says you have to number for yourselves not seven completed weeks like the Pharisees are saying, but rather seven completed Shabbatot, Sabbaths. Seven completed weekly Sabbaths must be completed. And the morrow after must give you 50. So if you are not getting seven times seven, giving you 49 days, and the morrow after giving you 50, and you have seven completed Sabbaths, then there is something wrong with what you're doing. Because again, the 16th of Abib, if you're going by the Pharisaic uh, tradition, if you're going to go by this, then the 16th of Abib could technically land on the third day of the week. So, yeah, it is true you could make seven completed weeks. You know, you could count seven days seven times, and the morrow after could give you 50, but the Torah says seven completed Sabbaths, not just weeks, Sabbaths. So you have to be able to have this actual Sabbath as part of the count, as part of the pattern. Seven times seven is 49. The morrow after is 50. So I had to go into that a little bit to explain because there are many people who are new to this information and probably have no idea that that is the case. Nor they you know, probably don't know much about the actual history as well because it can be a little confusion. There's a, uh, confusing. There is a lot of information out there, but this is where all this comes from. So we know that Pentecost, the Greeks called it the count of 50, literally Pentecost, which is Shavuot, which is weeks. Again, it has to fit the criteria, and that criteria is literally laid out by the first of the harvest of the barley because it is the first day of that count, the first day of that seven times seven, that seven completed Sabbath count that gives us the 49 the morrow after being 50. So, so Rashid Katsir has so many things that hinge upon it. Not only does the idea of the year appear to begin because of the idea of the Abib, which must be offered on this day. But also now we see that it is, you know, again, directly tied into by a chain of sevens. And this chain of sevens teaches us exactly what a week is and that it has nothing to do with the moon because there's no way that you could make this work if you had to recount it or recycle it, as people say, who keep a false idea of the Sabbath and say that the moon has something to do with the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. You see with Shavuot that it doesn't. It has, any, it has nothing to do with it. There's no way. It's mathematically impossible. If your count is not seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving you 50, then it's simply just not what the Torah says. And if you can accept that, then we can move forward and you can teshuvah and return and repent and continue to walk in Yahuwah's way. Okay, uh, we should also be aware of the practices of the first century so that we understand better the idea of the offering and so that we can understand the prophetic insights of the offering. Because on the 14th of Abib, that first month of the year, on the 14th day of that moon cycle, you will have the day that the Passover lambs are sacrificed. Literally, we know that that takes place at 3 p.m. Roman time, or it is also called the ninth hour according to the sundial. So at this time, the lambs are sacrificed. But what many do not know is what happens directly after the last lamb is sacrificed. The Kohen Haggadol and an entire entourage of Kohanim go to the Mount of Olives. And there, they bind standing shocks of barley. They do not reap of the barley, however, until the sun goes down on the weekly Sabbath. Because the morrow after, they're going to have to offer it up as an ascension offering to Yahuwah Elohim. So they bind these standing shocks of barley. 
And when the sun goes down on the weekly Sabbath, they gather and all the people of the land who are there for the pilgrimage feast of unleavened bread and Passover specifically, they behold this offering and they behold this special time when the Kohanim go out to reap of the harvest. And when the Kohanim go to reap the harvest, they cry out, has the sun set? And the crowd responds, can the sun has set? Yes, the sun has set. And then they say, shall we reap? And they reply, yes, you shall reap. And then they say, with the sickle, to get the permission of the crowd. And they confirm, yes, with this sickle, in this basket. And the crowd says, yes, in this basket, because the Kohanim have to offer up the first fruits in a basket before Yahuwah Elohim. And then when they reap of this harvest, the Kohanim go back from the Mount of Olives to the Beit HaMikdash, to the house of Yahuwah. And there they beat these standing shocks of barley that have been reaped. And they beat the grain loose from the heads. And we know that they prepare uh, the barley at this, this time, there's a lengthy process. Overnight, they prepare it to be an offering made by fire the following day as a first fruits offering, as an ascension offering before Yahuwah Elohim. It's very important to understand the way that these things were done in the time of the first century and how they were played out so that we can better understand the life, death, and resurrection of the Mashiach, but also so that we can understand the principles laid out in the instructions, in the Torah. That is what the word Torah literally means. It doesn't just mean law. It means instructions, principles, things that we should live by. Also, we should look at an example from Joshua, Yahushua chapter 5, Verse 11, and it says, And they ate of the stored grain of the land on the morrow after the Pesach. Now, some have said that this word should literally not be stored grain, but refer, it could refer to fresh grain. So it creates a question about how the idea of the first fruits offering should be done and on which day. And if we read it in context, it says, And they ate of the stored grain of the land on the morrow after the Pesach, unleavened bread and roasted grain on the same day. But literally, it could be stored grain, so that could be a literal answer. But if we want to go even further and say that this is fresh grain that they're eating, and we're wondering, well, how could they be eating it the morrow after the Passover? Well, it's quite clear. Because Yahuwah Elohim has said it must be the fact that the day of the Passover, which is the 14th, was a weekly Sabbath. And the morrow after would be the appropriate time to give the first of the harvest. Therefore, they could eat of the fresh grain as well. So it's not really a major problem. And we can even prove that further. We could go to uh, Numbers we go to Numbers chapter 33, verse 33, just to explain a little further, give you an example. It says, so they departed from Ramses in the first new moon, on the 15th day of the first new moon, on the morrow of the Pesach. So here we see that the day that was called the Passover is the Pesach, it's referring to the sacrifice of the Passover that happens on the 14th of Abib. So therefore, when it says it was the morrow after the Pesach, and it says right in the text it was the 15th day of the new moon, then therefore we know that this is the case, that Passover or Pesach is the 14th day. It's not talking about when the actual uh, meal is consumed beginning on the 15th. So here, this is not uh, proof for the rabbinical 16th of the uh, first month to be the first fruits offering of the barley, the Abib barley. But rather, we know for certainty 
that this, in fact, is not proof because there are optional ways to understand what is happening here because of the fact of what the scriptures tell us are the right the criteria for the first fruits offering and when it must take place on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So let's go over to Proverbs or Mishli chapter 3 verse 9. In the Proverbs it says, Esteem Yahuwah with your goods. That's talking about your produce, your tobin. And with the first fruits, with your bikurim, all of, your, of all of your increase, then your storehouses shall be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. So if you want your vats to overflow with new wine, if you want to have plenty, then you must give to Yahu Elohim your first fruits, your bikurim. That's the importance that we're talking about here with this festival. This is not just something minor. This is major. Remember, when the Kohen Haggadah lifts up this offering, Yahuwah said in Wayikara Leviticus 23, where we just read that he does it for our acceptance. We know that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is a day that is considered a day when the books are opened and that there is atonement made and forgiveness of sins and remissions of sins and there is acceptance. But many do not realize the fact that the very first concept in the year for this happens in Chodesh HaAbib, in the month of the Abib. Because when the wave sheaf, or literally the omer, which is lifted, the ascending offering, is literally a picture of this fact. We have to understand that Rashid Katsir, the first fruits offering of the barley, it has so many implications throughout the scriptures. It is not just, uh, again, it's just some minor day. It hinges on the fact that it is a picture of the atonement which would take place, a picture of remission of sins. It is a time of acceptance when the Kohen comes before Yahu Elohim in Kodesh garments as a set-apart man, one who is Kodesh, and one who bears the name of Yahuwah upon his head, and he lifts up this offering. It is done for your acceptance. It is done as a righteous offering. And so therefore, we are to esteem Yahu Elohim with our first fruits. And if we do so, then we will have plenty. Our vats will overflow. In Waikra, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, No grain offering which you bring to Yahuwah is made with leaven. For you do not burn any leaven or any honey in an offering to Yahuwah made by fire. Bring them to Yahuwah as an offering of the Bikurim, of the first fruits, but they are not burned on the altar for a sweet fragrance. And season with salt every offering of your grain offering, and do not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings you bring salt. And if you bring a grain offering of your bikurim, of your first fruits, to Yahuwah, bring for the grain offering of your bikurim, of your first fruits, a bib. That's what it says in the Hebrew. But in the English, it says of the green heads. But remember, we're talking about the fact that Yahuwah Elohim called the first moon cycle a bib. He named it after this agricultural moment in time. He named it after this first fruits offering. So this first fruits offering is of the utmost importance. It is done to commemorate the beginning of the year. The fact that Yahuwah Elohim has given us a new year, a new beginning. It says, and if you bring a grain offering of your first fruits to Yahuwah, bring for the grain offering of your first fruits, Habib, of green heads of grain, roasted on the fire. So the barley must be roasted on the fire. Again, that is the requirement for the Habib. It cannot be premature, Habib, because it will not be presentable to Yahuwah Elohim. If you try to parch it with fire, it's not going to work. It'll be too tender. 
It is not solidified on the inside. It cannot be used. But it must be crushed grain. And it says that the green heads, again, must be roasted on the fire, crushed heads of new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. So not only is it a grain offering, but we see frankincense is laid upon it. Why? Because frankincense is a part of the sweet savor, the smell offering, the offering that brings soothing calmness, that gives uh, esteem to Yahuwah, the incense. And remember, our prayers are a picture of incense. Our tefillah rise up before Yahuwah as incense. But here it's talking about the grain offering. So there is incense that is lifted up as well. And it says, and the priest or the Kohen shall burn the remembrance portion. Often when you see the idea of incense or the sweet smelling savor, you see the word zakar, which means a remembrance or a memory or a memorial, something to that effect. We know that it's scientifically proven that out of our five senses, as they say, that we use to experience the external world, that scent, our smell, our, our glands for smelling literally trigger memory more than any of those other senses. So Yahuwah Elohim, he has made us in his likeness, in his image, and therefore the idea of the scent, of the smells, bring forth the idea of a remembrance before Yahuwah, a sweet smelling savor. If we go to Devarim, Deuteronomy 26, verse 1, it says, And it shall be, when you come into the land, which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of the fruits of the soil, which you bring from your land, that Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you, and shall put it in a basket, and go to the place where Yahuwah your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. And we know that is Yerushalayim, which is called Jerusalem. And you shall come to the one who is Kohen, who is priest in those days, and say to him, I shall declare to Yahuwah your Elohim that I have come to the land which Yahuwah swore to our fathers to give to us. And the Kohen, the priest, shall take the basket from your hand and place it before the altar of Yahuwah your Elohim. And you shall answer and say before Yahuwah your Elohim, My father was a wandering Aramean or a perishing Aramean. And he went down to Mitzrayim and sojourned there with few men. And there he became a great nation, great, mighty, and numerous. And this is talking about both the lives of Abraham and Yaakov. Yaakov, who lived in Padam Aram. But Yaakov also has been called Jacob. He was renamed Yasharel, which has been called Israel. And Yaakov, he dwelt in the land of Adam Aram for 21 years, and his mother was the sister of Laban, who is called in the Torah, Laban the Aramean, or the Aramit. So therefore, there is a direct uh, uh, combination of these two bloodlines of the Arameans and the Hebrews or the Abrim. And we see that that is reflected, that Yahuwah Elohim wants them to remember that. Remember where they came from. Remember the forefathers. Remember their sojourns. Remember the things that he swore to them and how he promised to them that he would give them a land that flowed with milk and honey, that it was the promised land, and now the people are in the land reaping of the harvest to present to Yahuwah Elohim and the recounting Yahuwah's favor in their lives since the days of old, since the days of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who've been called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we go on further, it says, not only were they wandering Arameans that were perishing in the land, it says they went down to Mitzrayim and sojourned there 
with few men, and there became a nation great, mighty, and numerous. Because we know Yahusif, who is called Joseph, went into Mitzrayim as a slave, but there he gained favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and was made the right hand man of Pharaoh. And therefore, in times of famine, his brothers found refuge in the land of Mitzrayim, along with their father, Yaakov, and they lived in Mitzrayim, and there they multiplied. And of course, we know that there began to be oppression, and that is what it says right here. It says, but the Mitzrayites did evil to us and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Yahuwah, Elohim of our fathers, and Yahuwah heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And Yahuwah brought us out of Mitzrayim with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, with great fear and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now see, I have brought the Bikurim, the first fruits of the land which you, O Yahuwah, have given me. Then you shall place it before Yahuwah your Elohim and bow down before Yahuwah your Elohim and shall rejoice in all the tob or the great which Yahuwah your Elohim has given to you, you and your house. And the Levite and the stranger who's among you. So the time of the first fruits is a time of rejoicing, a time to bow down before Yahuwah Elohim, a time to recount how he has always been there and always watched over his covenant. And he has done what he has said and he has done what he has sworn to the fathers of old and how he is great and his kindness endures forever and his kindness is everlasting. And as they do this, they rejoice with the Levites and they rejoice with the strangers who are among them, the strangers of the other nations who believe in Yahuwah Elohim. They rejoice at this time as well. But of course, we know that Rashid Katsir, this particular first fruits offering is done by the Kohen. And the Kohen would say this exact oath. And at any time when any person were to bring in the first fruits, they would say this oath exactly as it is recorded in the Torah. So it gives us additional insight and to the time of this offering. Because Yahuwah Elohim has said that this is to be offered up, and it's to be offered up with incense, and that it is a picture of a remembrance. He said that it was in a remembrance, a sweet-smelling savor, and we are to recall all the things that he did. We are to have a remembrance of where he took us, how he took us out of slavery. And he brought us into the promised land. Now let us go to the book of Nehemiah, which is called Nehemiah, chapter 10 and verse 34. It says, And we cast lots among the Kohanim, the priests, and the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our Elohim, according to our father's houses, at the appointed times year by year, to burn on the altar of Yahuwah, our Elohim, as it is written in the Torah, and to bring the Bikurim, the first fruits of our soil, and the first fruits, the Bikurim, of all fruit of all trees, year by year, to the house of Yahuwah. And also to bring the Bikur, the firstborn of our sons. Remember that word first fruit and firstborn are exactly the same. They are both Bikur. Bikurim is the plural form. And also to bring the Bikur of our sons and our livestock, as it is written in the Torah, and the firstlings of our herds and our flocks, to the house of our Elohim, to the Kohanim, the priests attending in the house of our Elohim. 
and that we should bring the Bikurim, the first fruits of our dough, which is called challah. The first portion of the dough is challah. And our contributions and the fruit from all kinds of trees, of new wine and of oil, to the Kohanim, to the priest, to the storerooms of the house of our Elohim, and the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our rural towns. So there we see a beautiful uh, just recap of all the Bikurim offerings, all the first fruits offerings that are given to Yahuwah Elohim. And this was during a time right after the Babylonian exile when the house of Yahuwah Elohim was being rebuilt by Zerubbabel during this time. Of course, it was a time of great rejoicing because they had reinstituted the first fruits offering. So they are here. Uh, this is being recounted and you see the excitement and the enthusiasm that they have because they're able, now that they have come out of the land of their exile, they're able to once again offer up the first fruits offering. And in Ezekiel, Yehezekiel chapter 20, we get an interesting prophecy of a future event. In verse 40, For on my Kodesh mountain, on the mountain height of Yashurel, declares the master Yahuwah, there all the houses of Yashurel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I shall accept them, and there I shall require your offerings and your bikurim, your first fruits, the first fruits of your offerings, together with all your Kodesh gifts, as a sweet fragrance. I shall accept you when I bring you out from the people. And I shall gather you out of the lands where you have been scattered. And I shall be set apart or Kodesh in you before the Goyim, before the nations or the Gentiles. And you shall know that I am Yahuwah when I bring you into the land of Yashurel. And to the land for which I lifted my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. So we know that Yahuwah Elohim will gather his people in the land of Yashorel, that they will be gathered by a mighty right hand. Yahuwah Elohim is beginning to unfold these things as we see and we look. We see that Yahuwah Elohim's word is being fulfilled. We know that this is talking prophetically of a future event. That Yahuwah Elohim will gather his people and that they will once again offer up the Bikurim, the first fruits offerings to Yahuwah Elohim, and they will be for a sweet smelling fragrance to Yahuwah. In Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it reads, And I shall pour out on the house of Dawid and on the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, which is called Jerusalem, the spirit or ruach of favor and prayers. They shall look on me, literally in Hebrew it says, look on me, Aleph Tal, first and last. Again, the picture of the word. Remember, it says of the Mashiach, in the beginning was the word. And we know that this word that was with Elohim are the two letters, Aleph and Tal, which is directly beside the word Elohim in the very first line of the scriptures when it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. There right beside Elohim is the word Aleph Ta, which is pronounced et, right there in the passage. So here the idea of the first fruits will be linked to the idea of Aleph Ta because it says, they shall look on me whom they pierced, me Aleph Ta whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they shall be in bitterness over him as the bitterness of over the bikor, over the firstborn. So again, the idea here of the bikor, the first fruits, is directly correlated with the idea of the Messiah, the suffering servant, the idea of his resurrection and his ascension, his being lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim as an offering that had been reaped from the earth and had been crushed and had been beaten and had been prepared with offerings and put through the fire of Yahuwah Elohim. And he did all this 
all this so that he could be lifted up as an ascension offering. Yahushua, HaMashiach, the Messiah, he rose up to the Shemaim before Yahuwah Elohim on this exact moment and time. He is the Bikor. He is the firstborn. He is the first fruits offering. And he is a picture of every single Moed, every single appointed time, and every single word that is written comes from the idea and inspiration that came forth from the heart of Yahuwah Elohim, that came forth from his word, that came forth from the Dabar, that came forth from the Aleph and the Ta, that was with Yahuwah Elohim since the very beginning. In Matith Yahu, Matthew chapter 27, in verse 50 it says, And Yahushua cried out with a loud voice and gave up his Ruach. And see, the veil of the dwelling place was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth was shaken, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the Kodesh ones who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the Kodesh, or set-apart city, and appeared to many. Now, what is very beautiful about this particular prophecy, if you remember, that the lambs were sacrificed at the ninth hour. When we read in the context, we know that this was the ninth hour of the day that Yahushua gave up his Ruach. That it equates to roughly 3 p.m. Roman time. And at this moment, it happened on the 14th of Abib. And we know, as we said earlier, that if this was the time when the final Passover lamb was sacrificed and Yahushua gave up of his Ruach, that the Kohanim had gone to the Mount of Olives and there they had bound standing shocks of barley. At the exact moment in time that this happened, there were graves that were marked by being opened. Now notice, they did not raise from the grave until after the master Yahushua rose from the grave because he is the first fruits offering. It all hinges upon him. So we see here the, the same picture here, the same idea that here you see just as the barley stone uh, shocks were being bound. Now these tombs were being marked for resurrection. And on the day that the ascension offering of the Omer, of the uh, what has been called the wave sheaf, of the Omer of the barley, when it's been lifted up to Yahuwah Elohim, at this exact moment in time, Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah, presented himself as the ascension offering before Yahuwah Elohim. And there were those who rose up at this moment and appeared to many witnesses in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, as proof of Yahushua's ascension, of his resurrection, or literally his standing, as it has also been translated from the Hebrew. The word standing literally means ami, that he was standing, that he rose. So all these things are so rich in detail when you understand the Torah and the scriptures in their proper context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, But now Mashiach, or Messiah, has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit. He has become the bigor of those having fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For as all die in Adam, or Adam, so also all shall be made alive in Mashiach, or in Messiah, and each in his own order. Mashiach, Messiah, the Bikor, the first fruits, and those who are of Mashiach, those who are of Messiah at his coming. And then the end, when he delivers up the reign of, to Elohim the Father, 
when he has brought to nothing all rule and all authority and power. So again, the Messiah, who is the Aleph Tal, who Yahuwah says that they will weep for the Bikor, they will weep for him as a firstborn, and they will see him whom they pierced. Now we know that the Mashiach is the first fruits. And so therefore, according to what Shaul is teaching, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells you that we are supposed to honor and keep the Passover. Shaul says that Messiah is the Passover. Therefore, let us observe the feast. So we know that Mashiach died on the 14th day of the month of Abib. He, we know this for certainty because he is the Passover. He is the lamb. But do we understand what Shaul is also telling us? Shaul is telling us that he is the first fruits offering as well. So we have the key to know exactly when Yahushua rose from the grave. In Matith Yahu, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, it says, but he answering said to them, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the ben -Adam, the son of Adam, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And if we go to the book of Jonah, we get the very prophecy in chapter 1, verse 17. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So we know that Yahushua, when he died on the 14th of Abib, that it had to be that three days and three nights later would be Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley. So this is very key to understanding for certainty when Rashid Katsir is, but also for understanding the fulfillment of the prophecies in the scriptures. In Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, it says, And Jonah prayed to Yahuwah, his Elohim, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called to Yahuwah because of my distress. And he answered me, from the stomach of the grave, I cried and you heard my voice. That word grave is Sheol. In the King James Version, it's rendered hell. It says he cried out from the depths of hell. But it's Sheol, it means the grave. So when Yahushua said that the sign of Yonah had to be fulfilled by the son of man or the Ben Adam, the son of Adam that he must be in the grave for three days and three nights. That is because Jonah said he was in the grave. He said that he was in Sheol. He was in the grave for three days and three nights. So literally we know the heart of the earth. He had to be in the heart of the earth, the grave, Sheol, for three days and three nights. It's mathematically impossible with the Christian model of dying upon what they call Good Friday and raising on Sunday morning. And we're going to see why that's impossible. And also we know, obviously, that the Messiah's resurrection has nothing to do with the Babylonian deity called Ishtar, which is Easter, which I regret to even have used the name because the Torah says don't utter their names. And this video is about the esteem of Yahuwah. But I just have to bring this up. We know that that model is false. It is faulty. Because you cannot get, even a child can't get three days and three nights out of Friday at any point of the day to Sunday morning. It's mathematically impossible. And I think that if a person can't count to three, I don't know that I want them teaching me anything out of the scriptures. We know it had to be three days and three nights. So therefore, if Yahushua was the first fruits, if he has to be uh, ascended up to the Shamaim before his father uh, in the heavens, as they call it, Shamaim literally means the space, the expanse, all these various things. 
if this is the case, then the only model for knowing when Rashid Katsir is the first of the harvest that could possibly work is the clear Torah model. The clear interpretation that the morrow after the Sabbath is talking about the first day of the week and not the 16th of Abib, like the Pharisees say. Because you also can't get three days and three nights out of counting from the 14th of Abib to the 16th. The only way that this could be possible mathematically is that Yahushua would have died on the day that the Greco-Roman Empire calls Wednesday. We don't call it that. We call it fourth day. Yom Arba. But it had to be in such a way so that three days and three nights, the master of the Sabbath, the Adon Shabbat, rose on the Sabbath so that the morrow after he could be presented to his father in the early morning, just like the Kohen Agadol at the third hour of the day, which is roughly 9 a.m., lifts up the offering. We know that the Messiah had to be lifted up. This is the only way to make it work mathematically. It's no other way to make it work. It's, there's just no other way. It's fixed. It's a fixed interpretation. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with this information, you need to understand that you cannot get three days and three nights from the current method that is presented by Christianity. Nor can you get it from the current method that is presented by rabbinical Phariseeism. But what you, get, what you can get it in the Torah the Torah itself, with a literal interpretation, gives you the possibility for the fact that it could be three days and three nights later from the 14th of Abib. So, this is very important because, again, Shaul says that Messiah is the first fruits, and the book of Zechariah, Zechariah said that the Messiah who was pierced would be. A bikor. He would be a firstborn, a first fruit, and that they would weep and, and mourn for him when they saw him. Now, let's take all this and look further at the book of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 2, it says in verse 9, But I offer to you, he's still praying to Yahuwah Elohim in Sheol, and this is what he says, I offer to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I pay what I have vowed, deliverance, belongs to Yahuwah. In Hebrew, is Yahshua Ta La Yahuwah. Yahshua Ta La Yahuwah. This phrase literally means deliverance or redemptions belongs or is unto Yahuwah. And this very phrase is a picture of the Messiah's name because Yahshua is a part of the name Yahushua because the name Yahushua comes from the name of Yahuwah and the word Yahshua, which we see appear together throughout the scriptures. And we've already looked at many of those accounts in the videos on the Passover and unleavened bread and various teachings in this series. But here we see in the grave in Sheol, Yonah gets an idea he gets the, the uh, Ruach HaKodesh that comes upon him, the revelation of Messiah while he's in the grave for three days and three nights. He sees that deliverance is to Yahuwah. Now, when Yonah was spit out onto dry ground, this is obvious, a picture. It is a picture of resurrection. He was dead. He was gone. He was in Sheol. But then Yahuwah Elohim rose him up out of Sheol. But while he was in Sheol, he had the revelation that Yeshua Ta La Yahuwah. And he knew, he had an understanding of the Messiah, of Yahushua, Yahuwah's Yahshua. Okay, now let us go to Matit Yahu, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. And we'll look at just one of the examples of Yahushua's resurrection. In Matith Yahu 28, verse 1, it says, Now after the Shabbat, toward dawn on the first day of the week, is how it's translated, 
We're just going to go with that for a minute. Miriam from Magdala and the other Miriam came to the tomb. So if you went off of the literal translation of most of the scriptures, you would come to some type of understanding that the first day of the week is just now beginning and Miriam from Magdala is coming to the tomb. And of course, we know when she gets to the tomb, the master has already risen from the grave. So therefore, that alone destroys, destroys the idea of Sunday, sunrise, Ishtar, Babylonian worship, completely annihilates the entire concept. But what is hidden beneath the surface is very beautiful. Because yes, it was the first day of the week. Remember, Rashid Katsir has to be on the first day of a Shavuah cycle, on a weekly cycle. It has to be. So that seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after gives us 50. So seven times seven, 49. The morrow after is 50. It has to work this way. So it has to be on the first day of the week. But in the Greek, here it says Sabtu which literally means a Sabbath. And in other places it says miatan sabbaton, which means one of the Sabbaths. And in Aramaic it says chad the Shabbat, which means one of the Sabbath. And it is literally an idiomatic expression that many people are unfamiliar with that refers to the first day of the count of the Omer. The first day of the count of the seven completed Sabbaths that gives us 49 and the morrow after that gives us the 50th day, the day that is called Shavuot, that the Christians and the Greeks, they call Pentecost, the count of 50. So therefore, Miatan Sabbaton, one of Sabbaths, is letting us know it's the first day of the count of Sabbaths for Shavuot. Because the Torah says, count for yourselves, number for yourselves, seven completed Sabbaths. And even in the Aramaic, it calls it Chad de Shabbat, letting you know that it is one of the Sabbath, one of the count of Sabbaths. It's very specific. And this is the day, none other than the day, Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of each and every year. And this is the day that the Messiah rose. And this is the day to the exact hour again that that offering of the Omer is lifted up as an ascension offering. Let's continue in the scriptures. It says in verse 17, Yahushua said to her, speaking to Miriam, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Remember when it's translated, when the term wave sheaf is translated, it should literally mean an ascending offering, an ascending Omer. And here it says, Yahushua says, I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my Elohim and to your Elohim. So if we have the timing correct, we would understand that Yahushua was in the grave for three days and three nights. And then at that moment, right before the Shabbat, the Sabbath had ended, the master of the Sabbath rose on the Sabbath. And he was already risen when Miriam from Magdala came on Miatan Sabbaton, on one, the first day of the count of the Sabbaths, the seven completed Sabbaths, and the morrow after being Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. So it's very specific. He rose on the Sabbath. He ascends to the Father as an ascension offering before his Father at the exact moment. Remember, it was early in the day. When is the ascension offering of the Omer given? It is given in the morning at roughly 9 a.m. on the Roman clock, three uh, on the sundial, three degrees on the sundial. So Yahushua did this in the morning at the exact moment. And remember that this offering, it had to be beaten and it had to be burned, but it had to be raised. Yahushua, as the first fruits offering, 
He had to be beaten. He had to go through the fire and he had to be lifted up. And he is the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which has been called Melchizedek. Melchizedek literally means my king of righteousness. According to Tehillim or Psalm chapter 110, Yahuwah has made an oath to Dawid that his master would sit on the right hand of Yahuwah and that he would be a Kohen forever, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, after my king of righteousness, who is also the king of Shalom, the king of what has been called peace or well-being and wholeness and all these things in one word and more. In Yaakob, which has been called James, but his name is Yaakob, in chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every Tob gift or every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of turning. Having purposed it, he brought us forth by the word of truth for us to be a kind of bikurim, of first fruits of his creatures. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the bikur, the firstborn of all creation? Because in him were created all that are in the Shemaim and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulerships or principles or authorities, all have been created through him and for him because Yahuwah Elohim made all things through his words. He spoke and they came to be. So it says that all came through him. And it says, and he is before all in whom all hold together. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, the bicor, the firstborn from the dead, that he might become the one who is first in all. So just like Adam who, who erred and therefore sin and transgression and death began to consume humanity, Now, one who comes from Adam, the Messiah himself, has to go through death and be resurrected so that we can be first fruits because he is a first fruits offering. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, And they sang a renewed song before the throne and before the four living creatures. And the elders, and no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are those following the Lamb wherever He leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being bikurim, or first fruits, to Elohim. And to the Lamb. And this is speaking specifically of the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Yashorel, which will be sealed in the forehead with the name of Yahuwah, and they shall be first fruits offerings before Yahuwah Elohim in the latter times. We are all called to be first fruits, just as the Mashiach has been lifted up. We are to go through the resurrection and to be lifted up. We must put our belief and our endurance in the Ben Adam and the Son of Man and the Son of Adam and believe in the true narrow way and understand that he is not only the Lamb of Yahuwah, but he is also the first fruits of Yahuwah. He is the one who came forth. He is the King, the Sovereign that Yahuwah Elohim has anointed to be Mashiach. And he will be anointed and he will rule and reign from Zion, from Zion. And he will build the house of Yahuwah according to the scriptures. And he shall establish it. And the Torah shall go forth from Mount Zion as the prophets have spoken. But we have to understand the prophetic 
prophetic significance of Rashid Katsir, of the first of the harvest, to understand the richness of the firstborn and how the firstborn is the first fruit and how it is all relative and how it is all a picture of one another. Yahushua, not only being a firstborn male, but being a picture of the grain offering of the first fruits of the Abi barley that had to be roasted with fire and lifted up by the Kohen Haggadah who had been anointed with the Kodesh oil. All of this points to the Messiah, to the day, to the hour, to the moment in time. But I want you to remember in closing, that Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of barley, does not stand alone. It is connected by seven completed Sabbaths. And the morrow after gives us Shavuot. It gives us the Feast of Weeks. Again, it has been called a count of 50 in Greek. Even a further testimony, the fact of it being the 50th day from this offering, from the offering of the Omer of Abib Barley. So in the next study, we are going to pick up from this day, from the first day of the count of the Omer to the final day. So we are going to go through the seven completed Sabbaths, the counting of the Omer, and the morrow after we are going to learn about. And that day is a very special day a day of a first fruits offering, but this time not the first fruits offering of the Abib barley, but the first fruits offering of wheat from the land of Yashorel. And this time the people won't be eating unleavened bread during this time, but rather the actual offering that is lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim will be two loaves that are leavened. We are going to discover all of the beauty that is Shavuot. But there is no way that we can understand when Shavuot is or the richness and depth and beauty and prophetic insights of Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, without understanding this day, which has been called a minor feast day, which I think we have all discovered is actually a major appointed time that is called Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the Abib barley. Yahuwah barak you and keep you, and I pray that you will continue to watch the videos in this series, the series of the Feasts of Yahuwah. Shalom, shalom.